Hey yo, and what is up gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. This pre-recorded go-home show for this Sunday's Money in the Bank from the O2 Arena in London, England was an absolutely terrifying edition of Monday Night Raw and it's in more ways than one and not in the usual just because it's absolutely terrible way and we are here to talk about it right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw Review. Let's do it. Yowie, wowie, indeed. Thank you once again, Sledgeheads, for joining me. This episode of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw Review is going to be a little bit different because I actually have something positive to talk about. It is really good once in a while to have your patience and your loyalty rewarded in such a such a fulfilling fashion as the Firefly Funhouse delivers and paid off in huge ways tonight Bray Wyatt showing the world why he is among one of the most underutilized and uh, and just totally special and unique characters and in this reset if they fail him there may be no turning back I loved everything about what happened tonight on the Firefly Funhouse. And I'm going to be honest with you guys like I always am. You know if you've been watching for the last couple of weeks. I just I put it on the fence. Part of me wanted to shit all over it. But I told you guys let's. I'm going to be patient. And I'm going to wait to see where it leads. Before I really come down on either side. Of whether or not I like the Firefly Funhouse. Or this new version of Bray Wyatt. And after what we've seen tonight. How could you not like what has happened with this character transformation. Bray Wyatt comes out there looking like the lost member of Slipknot. He's got this fucking mask on, which reminded me immediately of, like, the new 52 Joker. It's a version of the Joker where he skinned his own face off and then wore his skinned face on his face because he's that fucking crazy. And Bray Wyatt, as he revealed his secret tonight in the Firefly Funhouse, just looked like an total psycho he had this very weird vocalization going on it was hard to understand what he was trying to say but you heard clear as day yowie wowie is going to be the new catchphrase for us on this show bray wyatt is going to be fucking phenomenal one of the biggest questions i have on my mind is when he actually does return to the ring and make his in-ring debut under this new version of bray wyatt is he going to be coming out to we're so happy to be your friend or is it going to be like some weird mankind thing going on where it's that song but it's kind of creepy and kind of just distorted and weird like i'm i'm so much more intrigued for the future of this character now. How can you not? I'm going to play that clip again. Watch this. Holy shit, man. That is absolutely the thing of nightmares. And <laughs> that's something I know quite a lot about. I love it. I absolutely love it. I told you guys they were either going to completely ruin this or they were going to actually do something special. And for once, they delivered. They delivered on something special. And whoever is behind this section of the creative of Monday Night Raw tonight, give this man the whole entire show. <laughs> I don't care if it's Bray Wyatt himself, if it's Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy, whoever it is. Give them control of everything because this was genius. For three weeks, we've just been... And, and, and I lost my patience. You guys remember last week, I was like, you know what, Bray Wyatt, I let you win. So do something. Well, he probably heard my message, I would like to think. And he this week, he did something. And God, was it great. There was something else great 
a Monday Night Raw tonight. It was a random matchup between Cesaro and Rey Mysterio. And while the parameters of how this matchup came together are kind of stupid and silly, the matchup itself delivered tremendously. For the first time, I found myself on Monday Night Raw engaged in a match and enjoying it. It didn't have to have any high stakes consequences. It was just the pairing of two fantastic superstars. And when you add the insane strength of Cesaro with the agility and the speed and the years of experience of a Rey Mysterio and you get what we get tonight on a Monday Night Raw. And I'm just like, yes, more of this type of stuff, please. Why isn't this more the norm? Why aren't we getting more shit like this instead of getting ridiculous opening segments that lead to tag team matches with superstars that we don't want to see? Why aren't we seeing more Cesaro and Rey Mysterio type matches other than stupid fucking matches at the end of this thing? A false count anywhere match with the stakes of a spot in Money in the Bank up for grabs while Money in the Bank is just six days away. Still shifting around the card, seemingly. Was this a last-minute change Vince just decided to pull off right before the show tonight? Or is this what they plan to do all along? Because if it is, what good did any of this really do Braun Strowman? Braun Strowman, Mr. Brown Spray Tan. What the hell good is he anymore? He can't even get into the money in the bank. Now, while I initially am okay with the substitution of Sami Zayn for Braun Strowman because I do not like big men in money in the bank matches, I said on this show, I think it was last week, if not the week before, Sami Zayn is the type of a superstar you want to see in a money in the bank ladder match. He just fits the matchup better. And like I said, while I'm not opposed to the switch, how they went about it just seems kind of forced, seems kind of rushed, and of course, if you're going to involve Baron Corbin, who has to show up for a second time on tonight's Monday Night Raw, and you're going to involve Drew McIntyre, what good does it actually do Sami Zayn? Did he defeat the monster on his own? No. And now Braun Strowman goes out there. He's supposed to be our resident giant. He's supposed to be this big monster among men, throwing people into dumpsters and flipping vehicles and pulling down wrestling sets and causing all kinds of chaos, but he can't handle three guys. Oh, well, it's Baron Corbin. He's a big guy. Don't even, because Baron Corbin shouldn't be involved in this. Now, I don't give a shit that he's in Money in the Bank. Oh, well, they're in cahoots. They're trying to keep the big man out of the match. Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit if they want Braun Strowman in the match or not? All that says is that they don't see Sami Zayn as a threat at all. So it's kind of disrespectful to Sami Zayn in one way. And in the other, it makes them two chicken shits. Because why would they be considering Braun Strowman that much of a threat? These guys have beaten Braun Strowman on multiple occasions throughout the last year. Who gives a shit about Braun Strowman anymore? He went out there and looked like a fool. He looked like a fool. Use your freakishly large body for some good. He's like Andre the Giant with none of the charisma. Yeah, throw some elbows, big man. Yeah, man, throw some fucking elbows. Do something. Do something. Somebody relay that message to Braun Strowman. Or if you're a fan of Big Mouth, somebody tell him to watch Big Mouth and listen to the old man in this episode. Because you are no Andre the Giant, bro. You do not measure up. This man was in attraction He brought people to the arena just to see him. It was something special. And Braun Strowman is the furthest thing from special that you can get. When you have this guy who was built up phenomenally. It started out stupid with all the jobbers, you know, the two-minute squash matches here and there. But all of a sudden, Braun Strowman just took a life of his own. And then you extinguished it underneath the boot of the big dog. So that we can get Roman over. So that we can make Brock look stronger. And now we come down the road two years after that. Do you give a shit about Braun Strowman? And now he's being beaten on Monday Night Raw by Sami Zayn. Thanks to two big fucking goons helping him out. And I'm supposed to give a shit? What good did it do? Oh, well, Braun Strowman still looks strong because it took three men to... No, he didn't. He's the monster among men. He's supposed to be the most feared and just most violent, brute strength type, incredible Hulk character on the roster. 
and in a match that clearly favors him, where there's no disqualification and weapons are in play and you could put people through tables and you could be this monster, he's the one being put through tables and being held down for a three count by three men. And because there's no rules in a false count anywhere, this can stand with something as important as a slot in the money in the bank up for grabs. It just, it's forced, it's rushed, it's stupid. It's stupid to me. We should have just put Sami Zayn in this match to begin with, but this just reeks of the WWE changing on the fly. Because all this really did in retrospect was damage Braun Strowman. Throw some elbows, bro! (laughs) He's the biggest, strongest... Most fearsome guy on the roster. Just beaten like nothing. Like he was in the ring with Roman Reigns. Once again. God forbid we have to see that anymore. Roman Reigns had to grace us with his presence on tonight's Monday Night Raw. The guy's been getting more action on Raw since he was actually a member of the roster. Guy's been on SmackDown Live. We barely seen him over there. They drafted him to SmackDown Live. He's been spending all this time on Monday Night Raw. What the hell? Oh, wild card! What did I tell you guys about the wild card? What do we tell Vince McMahon about his wild card? Take your wild card and shove it up your ass, old man. This is just an excuse for you to do whatever the fuck you want whenever you see fit. What other reason is there to institute this wild card? To bring in Apollo Crews? To Monday Night Raw, over to SmackDown, to lose to fucking Jagoff, Mojo, Bobo, stupid old Rowley? Talk about a fucking waste. That's a double waste right there. You brought this kid over to to lose in two minutes. Now, t- to be fair, wrestling is full of illusion, right? And in this matchup, Apollo Crews hurt his leg. He tweaked his knee or something like that. Part of me wants to believe... That that actually happened, and that's why they had to go home so quickly and finish this match in such a squash-type fashion. Because Apollo Crews should not be being squashed by anybody. But instead, no, he comes to SmackDown Live just to be served up on a silver platter to a fucking jag-off like Mojo Rowley. Wild card! It's doing great fucking things! You know what else the wild card did? It brought Elias back to Monday Night Raw. Another one that's been on Raw just as much as he was when he was actually on Raw. Another guy from SmackDown who's been just hanging out on Raw because Shane McMahon says so. Was Shane McMahon the fourth fucking member of the trade tonight? We had Elias, we had Roman Reigns, we had Apollo Crews, and we had Shane McMahon. Those were your four fucking members from SmackDown Live tonight. Fucking awful. So, so boring. The beginning of this show, it involved Roman Reigns, it involved Bobby Lashley, Elias, The Miz, and Shane McMahon. Five of of the, well, let's be fair, The Miz is fucking okay once in a while, and he proved that today as well. The guy's great on the mic. He's trying to talk people into being interested in his steel cage match with Shane McMahon. I don't care about this feud. I wish it would go away and die. Why Shane McMahon has to have two simultaneous feuds with The Miz and then Roman Reigns for whatever the fuck reason. Oh, because he punched his dad in the face. That was like three fucking weeks ago. Get over it. Seems like Vince McMahon's not even mad about it. Shane McMahon needs to claim vengeance over the big dog. Another just fucking useless segment, especially if you're a guy like me and you just don't care about 90% of the people involved in this matchup. You got Roman Reigns across the ring from Bobby Lashley, and I'm supposed to care. I'm never going to care about that. I barely care about either one of them when they're in the ring with anybody else. You put the two worst guys for me in the same ring together, the only person missing out of that equation was Baron Corbin, and he just might have had to put a shotgun in my mouth and pull the trigger. Fucking awful awful beginning to this show. A good 30 to 35 minutes invested into these storylines for The Miz and and for Roman Reigns and Shane McMahon and Elias and 
all leading to a money in the bank confrontation for all of these men that I don't give a shit about. I don't care about Roman Reigns versus Elias. It means nothing. It's happening for nothing. It's something we've seen on Raw multiple times before they were both moved over to SmackDown. And I could care less about anything more that's going on with The Miz and Shane McMahon, Steel Cage or not. I don't give a shit. So this match breaks down into a tag... I'm sorry, this interview segment, this Miz TV segment, which talked pretty much about nothing, led to Shane McMahon deciding to have this tag team match, The Miz and Roman, versus Elias and Lashley, and I decided to go take a shit because the pains in my stomach were too much from having to watch this match. I had to go empty out so I can get through the rest of the show. And by the time I got back... From the bathroom, Roman Reigns and The Miz win this match by disqualification because Shane McMahon had to get his grubby little mitts involved in this matchup. After the bell, people are getting thrown into sting, uh, ring steps and it, all kinds of nonsense happening until finally Roman Reigns and The Miz clear out the ring. Superman punches are being thrown all over the place and I just did not give a flying fuck about anything that happened at the beginning of this show. We talked about Seth Rollins and AJ Styles. They showed an absolutely fantastic video package highlighting both of these guys. I wish they would have delved a little bit more into AJ Styles' past and his upbringing and not just from the minute he came into the WWE. If you're a smart person and if you know your history, you know that AJ Styles at one time faced Seth Rollins while he was Tyler Black in a random, like, gym somewhere, I think, in Iowa, in Seth's hometown, or somewhere in the Midwest while Seth was just getting his feet wet. He went one-on-one with AJ Styles at an independent event, and AJ Styles, after the match, took a minute to actually tell this crowd, all 50, 60 people that were around, that this kid is going to be a big star one day. And man, did he not even know how true his words would be as he is about to face off against that very kid in the at the Money in the Bank for the Universal Championship. This video package was great. I love the editing team, the guys that put these things together. They make everything just so compelling from the soundtracks that they use to the visuals. It was a very good way to get you up to speed and where you need to be if you had no idea why these two guys are facing off. You'd think, oh, well, AJ Styles is a fan favorite. Seth Rollins is a fan favorite. You watch that video and, and you get it. You get it. And it, it was really, really enjoyable. And I like that, man. It makes me feel like classic wrestling from back in the day. That's what the, what they used to do. You didn't have to see them wrestle week after week. You have them in interview segments, and then you do highlight packages of what has been going on. Tell the history between these two guys, even though there's not much. And this is actually going to be the first chapter for them underneath the WWE umbrella. It was great, and I want more of that shit. What I want to see less of is more of the shit we had to see again. They went back to Braun Strowman dumping Sami Zayn in the trash last week. Charlie Caruso is backstage. He bumps into Braun Strowman. He gives a very generic promo. I only regret that the trash compactor didn't turn Sammy into a cube. Monster Braun. Gives a shit. And then he's confronted by some fucking worm on the staff. And he's like, oh, Braun, Shane McMahon wants to see you in his office right away. So now Braun's going to go see Shane McMahon. We come back from the break. Shane's in his office with Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn is being Sami Zayn, just being annoying, and he's nagging at Shane McMahon, talking about how Braun Strowman almost killed him last week. And Sami, standing there yammering on when Braun Strowman walks in, he tells Braun Strowman that Shane was about to give him his money in the bank spot and suggests that, you know, hey, you know what, said, I'll fight him. I'll fight Braun Strowman for it. I don't care. And I thought Sami Zayn lost his mind. But he suggested the stipulation that Shane make it a false count. Anywhere match with Braun's money in the bank ladder match spot on the line. Braun said he's I'm going to eat you alive. And then walks off. And that's how that match 
came to be. Isn't that compelling? Isn't that great? Sami Zayn wind his way into this matchup. Please. Fucking ridiculous. Mojo Rally versus Apollo Crews we already touched upon. <sighs> Which I absolutely hated everything about this segment. Apollo Crews apparently injuring his knee. The referee went to check on him a couple of times, but Mojo Rally took advantage of the situation. He mocks Apollo Crews in his face and then hits him to the mat with whatever the fuck his move is for the win. After the match, he's all happy and Apollo Crews is laid out on the floor and I'm just saying to myself, why am I watching any of this? Who gives a shit about Mojo Rally and why did you just do that to Apollo Crews? Kid should be being built to be at least mid-card status, maybe go for the Intercontinental Championship or something like that, but instead he's being shifted over to the show he's not on to lose to a guy that's not over and probably will never be. Absolutely wasted. Still to come, they say, we have the women's fatal four-way matchup, which is just standard Money in the Bank bullshit. Oh, we got Money in the Bank Sunday. How are we going to build up excitement for the women? <laughs> Let's do a fatal four-way. That's something we didn't do. Oh, but we're doing it tomorrow on SmackDown. Who cares about SmackDown? <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. The most boring way to utilize the talent for the Money in the Bank. And it gets even better because check this out. Alexa Bliss is backstage, and she's talking about losing her fucking luggage. Who cares about Alexa Bliss losing her luggage? And we are now, you've landed in London how fucking long ago? It is now at Monday Night Raw. If you didn't find your luggage by now, it's fucking gone. But apparently you still had your outfit to wear tonight on Monday Night Raw. That, that you had, but the rest of your luggage, you, you lost. You're telling me that's how you walk around? The way you were dressed for Monday Night Raw, that's how you were on the plane, that's how you came from the fucking U.S. to the U.K.? Don't even give me your fucking logic gaps. All right, so anyway, Nikki Cross is over there for some reason, and they start talking. They start talking. Nikki Cross ain't crazy anymore. Apparently, she's got a soft side. I don't understand where the fuck they're going with this. And to make it even worse... Nikki Cross tonight somehow became the lackey, for lack of a better word, of Alexa Bliss. Now, it's not like an official thing, and they didn't give them a name, and they didn't really make, like, a whole thing about it. But if you look carefully and you watch what happened, especially by the end of this night, Nikki Cross is now Alexa Bliss's bitch. And I'm thinking to myself, what are they doing? What are they doing to Nikki Cross. And now she's in this fatal four-way mashup, right? And we'll probably come across that pretty quickly. But I would just need to say this before I forget my point in, about Nikki Cross. And the fact that she goes in and fills in for Alexa Bliss, who cannot wrestle because she don't have her gear or whatever the fuck her reason is. We all know the reason is because she doesn't want to wrestle and they don't need her to wrestle because they just need her to look sexy and that's Alexa Bliss's job. And she gets that job done very well. But we insert Nikki Cross into this picture. What are the few reasons why they would use Nikki Cross? Well, they haven't used her since this whole shakeup. And actually, since she's been called up in the first place, we've seen her very sporadically in between. Very, very rarely, Nikki Cross has not been used at all. But now here she is. and She's going to be put in this match that's going to feature Money in the Bank competitors. And she goes out there in place of Alexa Bliss... And wins the match. Why did she win this match? Well, it would be another reason why she was in this match to begin with is because she's from the UK. She's a hometown girl, so they wanted to get the hometown pop. Is that... I, I don't understand. That's not the WWE's MO. Usually when you're in your hometown, you take the big L in front of all your friends and family. It's like a tradition or a hazing, however you want to look at it. But why the fuck is the girl that's not in the Money in the Bank match beating all the girls that is? Wouldn't that give her a reason to make a claim to actually be in this match? Listen, I just pinned Natalia for Alexa Bliss. Why can't I get in that matchup? But now we have no time for any of that because the fucking show is Sunday. I don't understand why any of this was done. 
Now, on one hand, I'm good with Nikki Cross getting a win. That's not ever a bad thing. But you took away everything that made her unique. You took away what made her special. She was like a modern day, new wave version of Aluna Vashon. She didn't fit the bill of your average WWE woman superstar. She was different. And that's what made her appealing. I didn't want to see Nikki Cross softer side. This ain't a fucking Sears commercial. This is pro wrestling. Why can't we have a fucking wild maniac lady? Would have been great. But instead of taking what makes her special and developing on it and enhancing it and making it better, they just take it away altogether. And now we're going to get this new version of Nikki Cross that I don't even know if I could stomach and it hasn't even begun yet. But if it's going to let her get wins, I guess it's good, right? The fuck out of here. So they have this weird conversation in the back and they end up coming up with this weird pairing and they walk off and well Bliss walks off and Nikki Cross smiles and and that's it. That's it. Now we go back to the ring for tonight's double contract signing and this probably was given a lot more time than it needed and while Lacey Evans shows great confidence and poise in the mic she definitely needs a better promo writer you cannot get more generic than everything that was said by all of these girls Becky Lynch has delivered the same rhetoric every single week Charlotte Flair same promo every single week saying the same thing every single week and then Lacey Evans just giving your very basic I'm here too kind of promo and whose fault is it is it really the fault of these girls no Is it because they've only had each other to fight for the last six to eight months? Probably. How many different ways can you say the same thing? How many different names can you call a person? How many times can we have the same conversation and make it interesting? I struggle with that every single week with this Monday Night Raw review because it just doesn't really change. And we keep getting shit like this. Long drawn out speeches. It finally breaks down into a scuffle. And then you have the two Charlotte twins. You could barely tell the difference. If Lacey Evans wasn't wearing a giant fucking hat, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Although Charlotte Flair looks like she's a good foot taller than Lacey Evans. They're standing over the beaten body of Becky Lynch after they put her through a table, each one holding the respective championship that they will be challenging for at Money in the Bank. Segment over... And they accomplished, I guess, what they needed to. Becky Lynch got some good shots in. She looked like she wasn't going to be taken down, but the numbers game just too much for the man to overcome as she ended up eating some wood. And not in a good way. Going through the table courtesy of the Bopsy Twins. And I just can't help but feel like this would look better on the WWE, and it would feel better to watch as a fan if, I mean, fine, you want Charlotte in there, fine, you could make the case for Charlotte, sure, but if you could have diversified it just a little bit, you know, throw an Ember Moon in there, I don't want to see Asuka again because she's only going to be in there to make it a good match and not really stand a chance to win, but just change it up, Nikki Cross would have been great, would have been a great change of pace. That's not what they do. They just give us the same old, same old bullshit. And in the, one of the worst segments of the night for me, Ricochet versus Baron Corbin. Ricochet now has lost multiple times in prime time on Monday Night Raw. I was a little bit forgiving of it with Bobby Roode, only because I thought Bobby Roode was going to be in line for a major push, but Bobby Roode didn't even make it onto the show tonight. So Bobby Roode beat Ricochet in a one-off and then took his glorious new mustache and hit the bricks. And I guess they have no fucking plans for Bobby Roode. And now it shows because they obviously have no true plans for Ricochet. And unless he's going to end up winning the money in the bank, this was terrible to do to Ricochet tonight. Having him in a match with Baron Corbin alone has to be some sort of punishment. But to have to go through this match, which he actually looked decent in, and he actually made Baron Corbin not look as bad as he usually does. I mean, he looks bad enough in his fucking Chippendales outfit. 
Right, why the guy can't change that up, I, I don't understand. I feel like he wears it just to spite us at this point because we all fucking hate it so much. But, you know, he ended up looking good because he was in there with the talent, the level of a Ricochet. Ricochet could wrestle a fucking broomstick and you guys would have the most entertaining match of the night. But the fact that the crowd actually turned on this match because of how much offense Baron Corbin was getting in, and then to have him end up winning in the end and going over Ricochet six days out from Money in the Bank in the UK, who was a hot wrestling crowd who was ready to see Ricochet out there and probably wanted to see the kid win, to put him on the mat and have his shoulders counted to three for Baron Constable fucking dickhead I just, I don't see the point. I don't see the point. I don't care how good you think the match was. You could have thought that was the match of the night. You could be the biggest fucking Baron Corbin fan in the world. This matchup was unnecessary. And him winning is inexcusable. Inexcusable. If anybody needed to build some momentum going into Money in the Bank, it was to give Ricochet another win after you've had him look like dog shit for the last couple of weeks. But instead, no, we get a fucking Baron Corbin victory in a match that went on a little bit too long, if you ask me, and then just totally shit all over all of the work they've been doing to get Ricochet to, I I, I don't know, I thought he was was mainlined for a push right to the top, and Vince McMahon had a mandate that Ricochet and Aleister Black are not supposed to be losing. But ever since that tag team has been split, Ricochet seems to be doing nothing but. So I don't know if it's his little man curse or if it's his, you know, a little bit lackluster in the promo department. He still needs a little bit of polish over there. I don't know what it is, but Vince McMahon seemingly doesn't give a shit about Ricochet. And hopefully we will continue to give a shit about Ricochet as well. Because there's only so long I could see these guys fall. And it only seems to me that Vince McMahon's got himself another NXT jobber to throw to all the people he wants to see succeed in this business. And for the most part, none of the people he wants are who we want. We see a replay from last week, from the backstage segment from Samoa Joe talking to Dominic, big little Dominic. And now we talk about, uh, we have Rey Mysterio talking about it with Charlie Caruso backstage. He said Joe crossed the line targeting his son, blah, blah, blah. Don't mess with my family. The same old tropes that you use in this situation. And it got a little weird because Cesaro interrupts and said that it's rude for Rey to talk about Samoa Joe when he's not here. Cesaro knocks Rey for bringing his kid to work. He said, oh, when did it become bring to kid your work day? Bring your kid to work there. I thought that was pretty amusing. And then Ray defends everything, telling him, you know, you might not know this, and I don't have to tell you this, but my son's actually training and whatever, and he's with me because he's training, and Cesaro didn't really give a shit. He said that Cesaro kind of looks a little bit more like Samoa Joe than Ray. Are you sure that uh, little Dominic's even yours? You know, hawking back to the old storyline of... Eddie and Ray battling over Dominic's paternity. A little bit of a callback there for us longtime fans. Next thing you know, Rey Mysterio attacks Cesaro, and the matchup is going to happen later on tonight, which I already told you guys was the best match probably on Monday Night Raw in quite some time. I'm going to be honest. I don't care what anybody else you listen to tells you. This match, however unnecessary it might be, however out of the blue It might have came at us. This was a great match between these two guys. If you didn't see it, go back. The only thing bad about it was the big fat commercial break right in the middle of it, which took a good three or four minutes away from us, which I'm sure some great shit was probably going down. Back from the break, Michael Cole leads us into the video package of Roman Reigns, the one we saw last week, the one we told you Vince McMahon had put together by the good people over at Brazzers. So that he could crank one off every once in a while when he gets his little Roman Reigns fits. This overly long, overly sappy, feel bad for me, look at me, and be happy for me video package for Roman Reigns. Again, out of place on Monday Night Raw. This isn't his show anymore. He opened the show, his segment is over, and he's gone. Why are we talking about him again? 
If anything, show this again tomorrow on SmackDown Live when he decides not to show up over there again. Why waste my time with this again? Then, <clears throat> excuse me, we go to Michael Cole talking about AJ Styles versus Seth Rollins at Money in the Bank, and then he sends us back to Sarah Schreiber, Renee Young 2.0, she says people to AJ Styles, she says people have been questioning his methods as of late. AJ says the recent phenomenal forearm that everybody is speculating whether or not it was an accident was indeed an accident. It was intended for Baron Corbin, but he will fight someone when he is disrespected. AJ goes on to say that this was Monday Night Rollins, right? He have to, he, um, Seth calls this Monday Night Rollins, but that was until now that I am here. He came with a huge chip on his shoulder. It's still there, and it got him a title shot this Sunday. He's going to walk into the Money in the Bank as the challenger, but he will leave with the Universal title and walks off. And for anybody out there that says AJ Styles is bland and boring, I'm going to have to go with you on this one, and it's not his fault. I have seen AJ Styles at his best, and this is definitely not him, and I feel like even if I were working for the WWE, as charismatic as I am, I would not be at my best, because I have to keep looking down at the floor to read the lines you want me to say, which in this point are generic. I'm going to walk in the challenger and leave the champion. How many times have we heard some shit like that? With the personal nature of this rivalry and the history that is unknown by many of us, there should have been something else a little bit more meaty in there for us to grab onto. Not just your typical, I'm going to give my best shot and I'm going to walk out with the belt. Because I'm AJ Styles. The Fatal 4-Way match came after this. We talked about it already. Nikki Cross wins this matchup. Dana Brooke, in a fit of desperation, pulls out a ladder and does a ladder spot a body splash off the top of a ladder on top of a group of girls that was completely unnecessary. Why this spot wasn't held off till Sunday, which is the only thing Renee Young said all night that made any sense. She said before Dana took off, she's like, Dana, save it for Sunday. And I'm like, yeah, save it for Sunday. Why are you doing this on Monday Night Raw? You're not going to get more people to watch because you threw your bag of trash off the top of a ladder on top of a bunch of other girls little overbooked old why because she's been on this crusade to prove that she deserves to be here in in what fucking universe maybe on earth 2 where you have some fucking talent Dana Brooke is in this fucking match but Ruby Riot isn't Nikki Cross goes out there in this fucking fatal four way and wins this match but she's not even in the money in the bank <laughs> please give me a fucking break other than that, this was your typical women's match. It was not bad. It was not great. There was not many botches. There was just that little bit of an overbooking towards the end. And Nikki Cross coming out your winner because that makes perfect sense. Let's make everybody in the money in the bank contending for a shot at the briefcase so that they could be a future world champion all look like a bunch of fucking losers in one fell swoop. Because that's what they did. We then had Rey Mysterio versus Cesaro, which again, I already touched upon. A fucking fantastic matchup. At one point, Cesaro had Rey Mysterio from the outside. Rey was standing on the ring apron. Cesaro was on the second turnbuckle on the inside of the ring, and he deadlifted him into a straight-up suplex position. Held him there for quite some time. Released, with, released his right arm and held him with one arm on top of the second turnbuckle for another lengthy amount of time before dropping him with a superplex, which was just a feat of strength that you have to see to believe. At one point, again, Cesaro showing off his superhuman-like strength, just flailing, flailing Rey Mysterio's body around in that airplane, airplane spin from one ring barricade to the next in one fluid motion, he was just slaughtering Rey Mysterio to the point where you thought the little man was not going to have enough to make it back at the end, but make it back in the end is exactly what he did when Cesaro would end up missing the Swiss 1-9 attempt. Rey Mysterio was able to make a comeback, hit him 
with that 619 and then the top rope splash for the finish. Rey Mysterio gets the win. He needed a win like this over a bigger, over a much stronger competitor to prove that he could hang in there with the likes of a guy the size and capability of a Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe obviously has a much more vicious side than, than Cesaro does. He is not the same by any means, but it is definitely a good test for Ray and a good way for him to build momentum. And it doesn't really hurt Cesaro as he's kind of stranded in limbo without Sheamus right now. And he's coming off being in the tag team division. He's already well established. Everybody loves Cesaro. Losing to Rey Mysterio, a legend in the business in his own right, was not going to hurt. And they did the right thing. And we got a good match on top of it. Tell me how many other people you hear probably saying that. But that's the truth because that's what the hammer delivers. I'm not just going to tell you everything fucking sucks and we're all going to die. Because sometimes there's some glimmers of hope. Which is the reason why we tune into this shit show as it is. Mostly we watch just to see how bad things are actually going to get. But every once in a while we get a moment like this and a match like this that stands out that you go, yeah, this is why I watch wrestling. But then we go to the next segment, which reminds you immediately why you don't watch wrestling. And we have the revival in the back and we have to talk about and see once again the revival shaving their backs. The revival getting all hot and bothered because of the oozy hot. And the revival wants to give this promo where they're going to tell you that we're not going to be embarrassed anymore while simultaneously embarrassing themselves because this guy wants to talk about his balls. It's like, oh, the Usi hot, the balls. Juvenile bullshit Vince McMahon humor. I'm sure Vince was in the back. Ha 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 ha. He's had balls done. Ha ha. Shit, man. Oh, the days of embarrassing the revival are done. And if you ever want to see who the real best tag team in the world is, the revival won't be hard for. How many times can you call yourselves the best tag team in the world when all you have done for the most part, is fucking lose. How many times have we seen the Revival on their back looking at the lights? How many times have they won the Tag Team Championships? Are they still the Tag Team Champions? How quickly did they lose those belts? They're the best tag team on the planet? I beg to differ. You may be a very good technical tag team. You may wrestle very well. You might have some cool double-team tag team style maneuvers. But you are far from the best in the world. You could have made that argument a couple of years ago when you were on NXT. But at this point, when you keep tooting that fucking horn and playing that same old song, all I want to do is change the channel. And I was the biggest revival guy that there is. And now I really could care less. I'm just waiting for the days when their contract expires and they can go to AEW and maybe try to reinvent themselves again and show the world what they can really do. Seth Rollins is backstage with Sarah Schreiber once again. She's talking to him about his match with AJ Styles and Seth Rollins gives us another very generic promo talking about how his Sunday will be a statement match for him and It's not about proving anything to his friends. It's not about proving anything to his family, but about proving something to himself, something to the fans, and something to AJ Styles. That this is Rollins' industry, this is his show, and he is the backbone of the company. (laughs) Rollins said how he did look up to AJ Styles 15 years ago, probably referencing that match that I was telling you guys about, but when the dust settles on Sunday... AJ Styles will be looking up at him. Pretty generic. Not too much behind it, really. Just basic. But I'm okay with it. Because at least they didn't put them in any matches where either one of them lost. Or or anything stupid like that. I would much rather have this than any of that. We talked about the Firefly Funhouse. We're not going to talk too much about it because I'll just keep going on and on and on about how much I fucking loved it. Bray Wyatt opened it up as usual in the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood type style and he is with Mercy the Buzzard and Abby the Witch. Ramblin' Rabbit 
was back, even though he was eaten last week by Mercy the Buzzard. I guess he was reincarnated. This week, Bray Wyatt has a secret, and he's going to show us finally this secret. The, sc- the screen is flickering back and forth as he says he's find out how to control. He's found out how to control this secret. He says that the fireflies help him and it warms his soul, but he still has some darkness in his head. He knows how to harness it and how to control it. And then he he shows us that fucking crazy mask. Oh, I friggin' love it. Absolutely my favorite part of this night. I don't know where he's pulling his inspiration from, but I cannot wait to see what is coming next. I can't wait to see him come out to the ring. What is he going to do? Is he going to start out dressed up like Mr. Rogers and then change at the top? Like did Mr. Rogers used to change his shoes. He's going to come out on the entrance ramp. He's going to, it's a beautiful day in Bray Why It's world and then put on the mask and then it's fucking crazy, right? I, oh, I am so intrigued, so intrigued about what's going on there. Then we had the Falls Count Anywhere match, Braun Strowman versus Sami Zayn, which broke down pretty quickly. Sami Zayn had no chance in the ring. He ran for his life. Next thing you know, they're running through the crowd. Then they're fighting up by the concession stand. Braun Strowman gets ambushed by Constable Corbin Dickhead. He's getting put through tables. Drew McIntyre is coming out of nowhere. Next thing you know, they're back on the entrance ramp with Sami Zayn. Everybody's hitting him with their finishing maneuvers. He gets a Claymore kick to the face. And then they pile on dog pile style to bury Braun Strowman and get him out of the money in the bank ladder match and have him substituted with Sami Zayn. And unless you are a blind man with no brain, you know what's going to happen at Money in the Bank. Money in the Bank is a ladder match, which much like a false count anywhere match has no rules. So what's going to stop Braun Strowman from coming out there and creating absolute chaos during this Money in the Bank? And God forbid he goes up there and grabs a briefcase even though he's not officially in this matchup. What are they going to do then? We're going to have a repeat of what they did with the women. Oh, well, the person that pulled it down wasn't supposed to pull it down. So now we're going to do it again tonight on Monday Night Raw. That is a terrible plan. If that's the plan. And it's just very predictable at this point. You know Braun Strowman's going to gain some measure of vengeance. And there is no other show to do it on. Unless he shows up on tomorrow night's Smackdown Live to wreak havoc. But why on God's name? Would he do that? I didn't want to see him tonight. It's bad enough. I got to see him anymore. All right, everybody. I am fucking exhausted. That is going to bring this review to a close. Thank you all so much for being with us once again. If you enjoyed this show, you can do this. And that's give us a thumbs up. Just like that guy. Yeah, I use a lot of clips tonight. I'm trying to get practice in there because we're going to use a lot of B-roll in this going forward because sometimes there are clips that illustrate what I'm thinking better than I can say it. And if you, in fact, think that I am the man and that I did awesome, you can give me and give this channel and this video a thumbs up and share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially... If they were flipping out over the Firefly Funhouse tonight, and most importantly, if you are not already one of the 1,400 plus that know that Sledgehammer TV is the place to be when you want your wrestling news and your entertainment reviews bullshit free, that there is no better place to subscribe to than this channel right here. Please consider giving us a subscribe and joining the family. The Sledgehead Army is strong. My brothers and sisters here, we are all one big happy family. Don't forget to load up that comment section. Let me know how you felt about tonight's Monday Night Raw. Did you think I went a little bit easy on it? Was my views skewed because Bray Wyatt sent me into some sort of a euphoric state towards the end of this match? Uh, Towards the end of this Raw, I certainly don't think so. I think I was straight down the middle and fair, but you guys 
feel free to let me know what you think as well. Don't forget to check out everything else we got on this channel. We reviewed Game of Thrones, who is right now rivaling Monday Night Raw as the worst show on television. Definitely going from from first to worst in record time. Much like Monday Night Raw, you want to know more about that? Check out the review. It'll be in the annotations up above, as well as everything else that we have available for you on this channel. The Avengers review, more Game of Thrones stuff, all kinds of wrestling news and reviews, everything available at your fingertips right here on your new favorite wrestling channel, Sledgehammer TV. <laughs> and, that's, and that's it. I'm fucking tired. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team, Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show and his tag team partner, the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball, the most important member of the team, as always, is each and every one of you guys. I love you all so very much, and we will see you tomorrow night for SmackDown Live. That is going to do it, and we are out of here, and we will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show, The Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com. One more time, Bray.